Hey, Sam. So don't tell anybody, but I'm hiding from the government, so I'm going underground. Bye. Bye, Ben. I guess I'll just have to do the podcast alone. Oh, there you are. Okay. I'm back. Just kidding. Welcome, everybody, to uh, episode number 51 of the Two Fish at the Table Poker Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Legend Ben One on Poker Stars. And I'm your other host, East Coast Sam on Poker Stars. This is another documentary episode where we're taking on three different documentaries and uh, also talking about the Mind Sport Olympiad, which both Ben and I are continuing to compete in. But first, we did want to talk about Greg Raymer, who, if you haven't, if you don't know who Greg Raymer is, just to give you a little heads up, he was the 2004 main event champion, the 2012 Heartland Poker Tour Player of the Year. Also, he was the uh, 2009 Nuts Segment Batter of the Year. Uh, great guy, three hour long interview, the longest interview with Raymer on the internet. He tells stories in it that he hasn't told in other interviews that I've seen of him. Highly recommend that y'all go check it out and watch it. Uh, and really, yeah. like, we were just in awe. I mean, that interview was probably 90% Raymer talking because I, I was just learning so much from him. And you can tell that he makes a great poker instructor because of just how he's able to to break down a story, break down a situation, and, and really communicate his his uh, his knowledge to somebody else. And um, apologies if you guys uh, were taken aback by just how long it was. But for me, it was worth every minute listening to him. And uh, I'm really, really happy that he gave us so much of his time for our lovely little uh, podcast. I so really appreciate it. And uh, that's not to say that if you want a guest star on our podcast, that you need to be uh, there for two hours and 45 minutes. We're, you know, if someone's on our show for 10 minutes, we're thankful for those 10 minutes. You know, it's, but uh, I, I, we had a blast. We had some great response online from that interview. And uh, it just makes me want to keep, keep finding some more great guests to just keep on adding to our great pantheon of interviewees. Yeah, and thanks to Greg for agreeing to come on. I know it's weird to have two guys who have a podcast that's fewer than 150 subscribers reach out to you. Be so generous with your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Go check out Fossil Man's book, which is uh, Fossil Man's Winning Tournament Strategies, which you can buy online. And he also mentioned that he's writing a second book. And then go and check out his seminars and everything uh, he didn't, you know, we didn't pay him anything, uh, but we're happy to plug his stuff. And anybody who comes on the show, if you have anything that you want to plug, let us know. And again, we'd like to hear from really anybody. We don't care if you have never won a bracelet or if you never won a big event or if you never even played the main event. You know, we want to interview anybody who has any interesting stories to tell about poker. So just let us know if you want to be on the show in any capacity. You don't have to be on for an entire episode, you can be on for part of an episode, whatever, as well as any suggestions that y'all have for content that we should be reviewing any other documentaries or movies out there we're happy to check out yeah and you know we i, I always root for past main event champions to repeat or do well in the subsequent main events and Raymer is now at the very top of my uh, uh favorite players to root for for this upcoming main event in july in just about you know four months so that's that'll, that'll be exciting to see and we, we do hope that we'll be in vegas uh this summer to witness at least most of the main event uh, we'll see how those plans are arranged as we get later down the year. But uh, I think it's time to shift gears here to our fifth installments of poker documentaries available uh, on YouTube for free. There's no barrier or paywall to see these films. Uh, we have a pretty interesting variety pack of uh, films here. They're all very different and accomplish very different uh, sort of poker television categories. Uh, this first one, actually, I uh, Sam had already watched prior to our pre-Ramer episode that I, I forgot to watch. So this one is Inside Underground Poker. Not so much a documentary, kind of more about like a one hour, or in this case on broadcast TV, 45 minute special. Kind of like something you might see on like the Travel Channel or on like Discovery something or, you know, that's sort of a cable channel type program. Uh, and, you know, a show that came to mind as I was watching this was the show Whale Wars, where they kind of um, hype up like uh, pre-commercial break, like, oh, no, what's that? Oh, what's that? And then something totally benign when the commercial breaks over. I kind of got a kick out of uh, that sort of uh, uh, TV technique that they used during this, this program. Yeah, as we, we talked about this when we reviewed Two Months, Two Million, both Ben and I grew up during the golden age of reality TV, where if you just flicked on a random channel, there would be some sort of reality show that may or may not be real. Let's just say if it's not outright scripted, it's edited in such a manner that the storylines might as well be fake. 
And this is definitely one of those types of programs. Uh, I don't have proof that it's a scripted program, but it's it's fake. <laughs> it comes off as very fake and unreal to me. But I really enjoyed that because I I have a soft place in my heart for just trash reality shows. So this is kind of well. It, it was kind of a like a TV like fake reality version of Grinders, a documentary mm -hmm. that we reviewed a couple episodes ago about the underground poker scene. And you know, I, I guess I, I believe that Mike does run underground poker game, but just not when there's like cameras documenting his criminal activity. Like I, I it's just kind of it's kind of a weird gray zone where like people will allow themselves to be filmed doing breaking the law like I don't know. I mean it, it's a it's a weird thing. I tried to view this from two different lenses. One is this is just entirely fake. And this is or this is this is entirely real. And so I tried to, you know, visualize in my head if I, you know, forget the middle ground. I, you, you, you're going to try to crazy trying to figure out is it real, just fake, scene by scene. You just got to commit to one path, real or fake. And I think that if this was real, uh, it really wasn't all that exciting or enlightening. I mean, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny to see all these like schmoes be like taking this taking this whole thing really serious. So it's kind of a norm charm to it, I suppose. But uh, the closest thing this program really comes to a narrative is that Mike kind of moves the game from spot to spot in the city, in the greater New York area. So Manhattan or Brooklyn or Staten Island. And so, and that's kind of a weak hook to kind of draw your attention because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't speak to how much money he's winning or, or making or losing as he's running these games. So it's, it, it's not particularly much of a, of a hook to draw your attention from that point of view. Um, I, I did appreciate, I guess, like just he, just just hearing out loud the various elements you must consider when you're running an online when you're running an underground poker game, which I guess is true whether it's real or fake. Like you know, being worried about security because you know you have a lot of money on the table. You want to make sure your players feel safe and that you feel safe running the game because obviously you get robbed and then it's all for naught. Obviously, moving the location, uh, the customer experience is very important. That's definitely an emphasis for like you know the the food, the beverages, the service. You know having some, you know, waitresses to, you know, you know, kind of like an, a light hooters sort of an experience for, for the, for the customers or the, or the players in this case. And then of course I've in the cop. So that was, I mean, I, I would have, I could have guessed that if you had, if you would ask me to name what to worry about if you're holding a game, but, but at least that was and in some context, I'm, I'm kind of reaching it, but that was in some context kind of, kind of, kind of real, I guess, to hear about out loud. But again, I'm kind of reaching there. Oh, you. Yeah, it's, I just think it's fake. <laughs> Again, well, no, as I, I said, I, do, but, but I know I agree, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like um, something can be fake, and you could still, it could still be informative by accident. Sure, uh, <laughs> you know, I just I regarded this as again just being like tacky, you know, two thousands, early twenty tens era reality TV. I mean, in terms of what you learn about poker, yeah, I mean, the guy who's running the poker room, his name is Mikey Tats. Just, just close your eyes and try to envision in your mind what a man named Mikey Tats looks like. This is what Mikey Tats <laughs> looks like. Anyway, he runs this poker room and he has to move around to a few different locations. Yeah, like you said, you know, what, there's one scene where he's driving to a location and it's this, it's this very strange, it looks like a parking lot, but there's these, I don't know, trucks or something that are in the parking lot. And he's driving around for a little bit. And it's just pitch black. There's no lights in this place. So he just drives out of the parking lot. He's like, it's too dark here. You don't want to win $10,000 and come out into a dark parking lot, which again is kind of interesting. But yeah, I mean, there's no real tension in the storyline. There's no, we don't really learn a whole lot about Mikey Tats as a person. I guess the closest to a character moment is at the very, very end of the documentary where he's, He's being interviewed and he's like, I'm not afraid of going to jail, man. You know, I'm not scared of the cops. You know, he doesn't say that he's been to jail or not, but it's it seems like that was supposed to be, you know, the big sort of emotional clencher of this. Mm -hmm. It also just feels to me like this was this was a pilot that they opted not to <laughs> make other episodes for, but they decided to just air this. Like, you know, you kind of get the feeling that again, because there's no plot line, it's sort of supposed to be like a character introduction episode you have mikey you have tommy the banker who's this john the banker what i think it's john the banker oh okay whatever john the banker mm -hmm. and he, you know this banker character who's i don't know how much money he's supposed to have i don't know what he's supposed to be a banker can mean a lot of different things can mean somebody who's a bank teller i mean it doesn't have to be somebody who's working on wall street 
you have this guy breezy who's the sort of young gun of the role even though we don't see him actually play really any poker we just kind of show that he wins a bunch of hands and then this guy joe mush who is this the worst nickname ever i've ever heard of poker just a terrific nickname just this i I don't know how to put this this easily just this loser who's (laughs) playing poker and has all these debts with everybody like there's all these these characters here and all these storylines that you could see being developed in subsequent episodes and they just don't do it. Uh, it's just strange. <laughs> yeah, and and so so I guess Mush has a slight story in that we we see that he's kind of a loser. He's in debt to to, to Mikey. He's sick of he doesn't have money to, to pony up to pay up. And so Mike kind of enlists him in exchange for some of his debt being removed to recruit other players from an from a rival underground poker game and it's just kind of it kind of plays out exactly as you would expect it's just kind of like it, it works of course you get a couple players in and and he's you know his in his uh debt is slightly shaved off so he can you know borrow against it just a little bit longer um it's it's funny again through the lens of this being fake and just trying to be entertaining i, I did feel like i was starting to kind of get mildly engaged in, in the in the in the fictional theatrics towards the end and it just ends all of a sudden so that was a bit of a shame. I, I guess, again, if it had been a pilot for a show, I might have been compelled to maybe watch episode two, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, just almost, even if just, just to kind of laugh at it, at the very least. Uh, it, again, it, it's just nothing nothing essential as a, as a poker viewer. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it accomplished the small goal of wanting to see more, which, which is what difference between, between television and movies. Movies, you know, you're supposed to give it a whole experience in one, usually. And of TV, it's meant it's designed to make you want to watch the next episode. So it did technically accomplish that goal, but being a one-off episode, it doesn't really uh, doesn't really work out in the end. Yeah, there's just a lot of really just funny, narm, unintentionally hilarious scenes. There's this one moment where you know Mikey's at the beginning. They've established you got to look out for knives and guns. You know, someone can come in and crash the game, and then the camera cuts, and there's this like security camera footage of this guy. He looks like he's 17, like this scrawny <laughs> guy. Like, far away from the camera at like the end of the driveway so mikey and some other guy like go out to him and and get him off the premises and are like intimidating him it's very funny uh there's this bizarre scene where uh mikey and mush are like meeting somewhere in this like dark street or whatever and you know mike you gotta grab a couple of guys to you know pay me off man you know you owe me all this money it's just like Again, something out of a bad gangster movie, a, a knockoff of Goodfellas or something. Like, it's just so funny. It's just yeah. so weird. Just all the fake tension that goes on. Yeah, and, 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 you know, it's funny. I mean, because for something that's fake, which it probably is, but, and you know, there's not 100% chance. 100% chance is some real mixed in there. Uh, you'd think that they want to throw in, like, you know, an actual, like, almost touched by the cops sort of. Right. Uh, scare in there they didn't really do that they didn't go all the they didn't go all the way like fake to make it really seem overly dramatic so uh i guess i give them a little bit of points for restraint there but uh it's it, it, it made for a bizarre watch i'm, I'm kind of happy i saw it in the end i mean i watched it you know again at my usual 2x speed so it, it came by in 22 minutes so it was not a huge time sink um but i, I mean i wouldn't i wouldn't rewatch it I, I, I can't recommend it to somebody else knowing it's only one episode not a whole series but you know, it it, it it stood out from the other films we've watched as far as its unique sort of trashy reality angle it had going for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there's technically it's, you know, trying to seem cinema verite, so to speak, you know, a lot of handy cams and all that. And again, all these people are in this illegal underground poker game. And at one point, you know, the area in Manhattan that they're going to go play in is hot. Oh, no, we can't go there because the police are going to be there. But they they play the game anyway. You know, they're trying to just get drum up the suspense, drum up this tension, but nothing really happens. And we it just it just comes off as really funny to me. Like I was just laughing at so much of this. It's it's it's, it's kind of a weird, like like almost a mockumentary of Molly's game in a sense. Yeah. Only of course minus the uh Idris Elba and just contesting and acting. Yeah. So I, again, I, again, a, a marginal thumbs down if we're gonna go Ebert style for this for me, but you know, marginal. Because it, it was it was unique. Yeah, I give it a one out of five, which is what I give so bad it's good media. This is so bad it's good. So if, you, if you're like on an airplane or something and you're really bored, you could watch this and you'd probably, you'd, you'd, have, you'd get, there's enough giggles in here that you would like it. Mm-hmm. 
I, I can't say the same for our next documentary. Uh, in, it was more of a TV movie, really, called The Million Dollar Deal, a 46-minute long, again, it an air in a one-hour block on television back from 1999, uh, which really, it's kind of a uh, alternate take on if you were going to watch the Poker Go broadcast of 1998 main event. It kind of is in that same feel. Uh, it covers, it, it talks to a good number of players during the 1998 main event, Andy Black being one of the prominent uh, folks interviewed. Uh, and it, it again, it, it kind of felt like a, I, I thought we had gotten away from those classic main, those retro main event broadcasts in the 70s and 80s that we really were pretty down on for the most part. And um, even though this was only 46 minutes, it really dragged for me. Yeah, so it's a TV documentary that focuses on the European players who were at the WSOP that year. And yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty generic. Uh, you get a lot of interviews about them playing the main event in 1998, uh, talking about the WSOP, their experiences in poker. I, I mean, if you're really into Andy Black, uh, Donaghy O'Day, who's probably the biggest Irish poker player of all time is also in here. Uh, you also have a couple interviews with Scotty Wynn, uh, if you know, if you're into that sort of group of poker players, that you know European contingent, there, you could enjoy this fine. But as of yeah, I mean, at two x speed for me, there just really wasn't that much here. It's just very generic. I, I mean, I, I give it a two out of ten, but I give it one point because there was about two minutes that I actually kind of enjoyed. There is a uh, a portion where uh, Mr. Mike McGee is talking about how he went from being a big stack to bubbling the entire event, yep. and just kind of. Focusing on one part of the tournament, one plus experience, Bobby Hoff kind of sucking, suckering him in and how that led to his complete decline. That was, you know, decent to listen to. I, I was paying attention during that part, I would say. Yeah, that was a decent part because he, bub he bubbled too. He was 28th and 27 people get paid, which is always just sick to see big player that you expect to steamroll go away. But yeah, I mean, this documentary, the hope is to follow European poker players and then none of them none of them make the final table none of them have very big deep runs uh yeah i mean i don't know. i mean it's it is kind of an interesting snapshot into what poker was like in the late 90s that you know they're talking about you know until i've won the first pot i'm not comfortable and you have to put it all in with confidence and play tight and all that and you know sure enough you see how poker evolves in just five years uh you know yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of backs, you know, you learn about Andy Black, how he started playing poker, essentially just because the casino was serving free coffee. And, you know, you hear about how Donaghy O'Day distinguishes between cash games and tournaments, and how Andy Black is a little reckless, he doesn't apply himself as much to the game, he feels like he has to win right away. That's kind of interesting, I guess. Yeah, but, but you know, really, it's, it's nothing all that special. It's, it's very forgettable. And, uh, you know, it, again, it harkens back to those retro, just like monotonous poker documentaries from 70s, 80s and, and late night up to late 90s really just weren't particularly interesting or, or unique in their execution of the topic at hand. Absolutely. And that leads us to uh, the longest of the three films we're discussing here is called All In the Poker Movie. And I was a little confused by this movie because if you go to IMDb, it says it was made in 09. But then it talks about events in 2011 on Black Friday. So I'm a little confused by why it was demarcated in 2009. Yeah. Uh, this one is about an hour and 50 minutes long, or 110 minutes, so a little under two hours. Uh, so I think it makes probably, I think the longest of all the films we discussed, or maybe the second longest. Maybe. And so this, this one, I kind of, if you take a mashup of Ultimate Bet, the documentary about all the black fr uh, the ult all the cheating online and uh, the online poker scene, and combine that with, I think it was like Bet Raised Full, the like online poker documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it kind of combines those two films together in a far too fast moving, very sort of like let's, you know let's let's spend ten seconds on one topic and move on to the next one and have a boatload of interviews about about each topic. So it's a very scattershot uh, edit in this documentary. Yeah, I mean, it's it's intended for people who are not super into poker. Mm -hmm. I kind of saw it as a premiere of, you know, here's what poker was like in this period of time. Here's your introduction to poker history. Mm -hmm. You know, it talks about how Amarillo Slim introduced the game and how Doyle Brunson sort of helped popularize the game and what fueled the poker boom and all that. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's a basic, like, here's here's what poker is. 
here's where this game has evolved. Here's where it is now. And then, you know, it ends with Black Friday. So it's kind of a, an awkward note to end on, especially when you're also having Howard Letterer and Chris Ferguson. Exactly. Be so that was the weirdest thing. Yeah, I mean, everybody who's who was anybody in poker at the time is in this documentary. They got Chris Moneymaker, interviewed him several times. They got Howard Letterer and Jesus, as I just mentioned. They had uh, Daniel Negreanu. They had Vanessa Russo. They had a bunch of different people. Pretty much everybody except Phil Ivey is in this, and Phil Ivey appears briefly. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's again, it's like a decent little foray if you don't know about poker history into poker history because ben and i know all about what happened with the poker boom and what happened with online poker and all that it's not that's interesting the problem i i have to think that i, I probably would have scored this a little bit higher had we watched this one chronologically first mm -hmm. amongst all the documentaries but because we've covered a pretty comprehensive look of a lot of facets of the poker scene this was a lot of review uh a couple of things i did appreciate was just there were a few select poker opinions on a few topics that I actually appreciated hearing because we had seen a film about it and we didn't really hear those players discuss that specific topic. I'll give you an example. Uh, there was a couple of interviewers talking about how just how boring those retro well, main event broadcasts were and just had the same opinion that I had. And it was just kind of refreshing to hear someone else at least refer to those like the, the, the original, like Jimmy the Greek narrated uh, main event broadcast as, as a snore fest. I, I just kind of appreciate those you know, there's a few spots like that where I, I couldn't appreciate the opinion being discussed at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I didn't know too much about the Mayfair Club, so that was kind of neat hearing that mm -hmm. Howard Letter and Phil Lockett into the game. Also talked about how Rounders came about, and there's just kind of amusing montage where everyone's claiming that they got their lines or personal life stolen by the writers. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, there's there's some amusing stuff here and there. Uh, Phil Helmuth saying that it's a dangerous time for him at that moment in time because he has everybody trying to make money off of him. That was that was I think that was my favorite moment in the whole <laughs> documentary. No, I mean uh, yeah, during the end credits, Helmuth has a very egotistical uh, little sound bit there uh, to end things on, on a funny note. But um, you know, there's really kind of there's two trains of thought this film follows. One is poker history start to finish, and or by finish meaning up to Black Friday. And then Moneymaker's story is kind of intercut throughout the whole film. And for the most part, I mean, we know most of the details by now. I, I did appreciate the the detail they went into, that they that were pretty comprehensive in covering the full timeline. And they spliced in a few uh, clips of Moneymaker. I mean, unfortunately, there's a pretty lengthy montage of Moneymaker winning in that main event uh, yeah. towards the end, of which I didn't think was really needed. I, yeah. I, I think it's it's more it's I think it's more substantial just to discuss the story behind his, his uh, entering the tournament before then actually showing him how he wins. I mean, you can mention the Ivy hand, you can mention the bluff hand is the far hop, but everything, everything else really is needed, if you ask me. Yeah. Uh, besides that, though, I, I did I did appreciate the section with uh, Henry Orenstein, who mm -hmm. uh, was a key figure with whole cams in uh, for poker on television. But uh, I, again, it's, it's, it's a little bit unfair because it's this movie, I suppose, because we're not approaching it from the perspective that they were expected audience would be expecting mm -hmm. to, to listen to it but uh I, I would probably add a point out of 10 to somebody else watching it but for me it's like a three and a half out of 10 for me yeah uh, i didn't give my rating for the million dollar deal that's like a two out of five which is forgettable for me this is also like a two out of five but i'd say if you're not if you're if you don't know a whole lot about poker this is like a three out of five it's a good good basic guide as to what poker was like during this period of time. You know, it covers like, you know, cards, New Orleans, uh, Amarillo is slim, popularizing the game. You know, a lot of stuff that uh, if you were coming in totally coded, we surprised, oh, okay, I didn't know that. That's that's something. But again, it, the topics move very quickly. I mean, it, it covers a lot of ground and doesn't really focus on any one subject for very long. It, it has to mm -hmm. cover a lot of information. And so that's also a, a fault if you ask me. I, again, kind of like the ultimate bet, there are individual topics that I really want to hear more about because it's something I haven't thought about before or I want to hear more details about. And it, it just moves on to the next topic so quickly that you're kind of like, oh, come on. Yeah. So, you know, so I, I, again, I, I, you know, I'm not unhappy I saw it. I just think that it, it was just uh, at the wrong time in my, in my life for this movie, we'll say. Yeah, I think my favorite part of uh, this movie, All In, was the scene where Dominic Swain went all in and she made a bunch of weird faces as she was uh, losing her chips. 
Wrong all in, my friend. Wrong. Oh, all in. oh no. Oh. So there you have it. Our uh, this, you know, in our in our looking into YouTube, that this was kind of the last of the substantial, like more than twenty minute documentaries available about mm -hmm. poker uh, online. So this might be the 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 last few films we'll discuss for a while, as far as documentaries are concerned. We'll see if more pop up. I mean, obviously, we were a good one that was that came out a couple weeks ago. So anything's possible. But yeah. uh, for now, we've covered a good roster. And again, most of them are pretty forgettable, but, you know, I'm, I'm happy I saw most of them, so I don't feel too down about it overall. Yeah, I mean, if you're somebody who's like us, knows enough about the game, uh, yeah, you can skip most of these. I mean, the worst one would probably have to be the, the Search for the American Dream, where it's like there's the potential for a good story and it just slips through the documentary. And then I'd say probably the best one would have to be uh, bet race fold, I think. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I like nosebleed. I thought that one was pretty good too. I mean, those are the two that I would recommend. Nosebleed would probably be the one I'd recommend to people who are sort of like regular poker players. And if you're more like Ben and I, sort of experienced hobbyists, then you can watch bet race fold. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the thing that you must see, just if you, again, if you're if you're a poker completionist, if you want to learn more about the game, you can watch this. I, I thought that the more personal a documentary was the more I enjoyed it. I mean, yeah. Negronos is pretty personal, but it's a bit, a bit more detached personal. Whereas mm -hmm. the ones that are following these like intimate looks into a few select individuals' lives, particularly during a you know time of poker, whether it's during a World Series of Poker uh, roster event or something, that was really when I was the most engaged. And it's when those those films of that category squander that opportunity, like with the Stanley Lee, Chris Leung, or American Dream films, when they squander that opportunity, that's why. I tend to be a bit more negative than I uh, would normally be towards documentary. Yep. And if Poker Go can uh, have a season of Inside Underground Poker starring Mikey Tats, that would just be great. I'd, I'd be all in on that. We, we, we would review that and we do it for free. We, we do whatever, you know, rewatch podcast for them. No problem. Yeah, absolutely. So coming into uh, the last stretch of the 2023 Mind Sport Olympiad. So we're, we, there's two more events have happened since our last discussion about them. That being the uh, the heads up uh, no limit hold'em event and the six card Omaha event. So I, I actually, so I, I don't know if any of our viewers were paying attention, but during our Greg Raymer interview, I was actually simultaneously playing the the end of the second and the start of the third round of that tournament while we were interviewing Raymer. Uh, I think I did a pretty good job of, of not making it super obvious. Uh, that tournament had uh, I think twenty. 28 players in it. I did not get a first round by. Uh, someone in this podcast did get a first round by again. I wonder who that was. And yeah. so uh, he makes it to the, to the round of 16. Me, I was down early in that first round. Uh, I won a big pot with Ace King where I had a top two pair. And then there was a hand where I had Jack 10, made trip 10s, made a big bet on the river. He called, got paid off. And then he kind of was tilty. So he he went crazy with ace eight. He three bet shoved ace eight. I called it ace king. I, I put some big hands those last couple of hands. He flopped an eight, but then I rivered a king to close out the first round. So thank goodness. And I was not actually the first, the last match to finish in that round. So I finally broke that streak compared to the uh, heads up uh, PLO tournament from weeks prior. So again, Sam and I are both in the round of 16. Very exciting. Uh, once again, uh, it's important to note that when you're playing the MSL, you're playing against players all over the world. So they're they're pre-registering for this tournament before they actually uh, can play it. And certain players in this tournament were uh, sitting out from the start. And there was a, a match in the first round where both players were sitting out. So somebody had to advance the next round. So they must have just like plucked somebody, put it into the next round. And that person was matched up against Sam. Yeah. <laughs> So basically, he got uh, two uh, buys in those first two rounds to advance to the round of eight. Uh, me, once again, I was I was behind uh, in the first round, the first couple of levels, just was pretty card dead. And then Raymer, the Raymer interview begins, and it's uh, right as that first break is uh, is going. Mm -hmm. I uh, I'm you know this is mid interview, the first the first third of the Raymer interview, basically. And then I just was, you know, not, I was just like split second deciding I'm going to do this or that, or that. And I was just chipping up, 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 up. 
until I got them down to about, I think, uh, 3,000 chips. So I have about a two to one chip lead. Uh, I won a, a, a flip that went in all in pre flop. I had two sixes. He had ace queen suited. He flips a flush draw, and then I reverse straight. So it didn't matter. Uh, so I advanced. So, so we are both in the round of eight mid Raymer interview. And then in the round of eight, uh, I is again the the metal bubble essentially. If you mix the top four, you get a medal. Sam uh, elected, and I respect him for it, even though it, it, was, it, was, it was a little bit of a shame that he just decided to uh, fold his way to, to respect the interview. I was, I figured, you know what, I'm going for my first medal. I have to, this is my, this is my best shot uh, since the last heads-up championship, so I might as well go for it. Uh, I was down early. It was a very back and forth. I got my opponent down to 1,300 chips, which was about I want to say like six, six or seven big blinds. Mm -hmm. uh, like the next hand, I put them all in. I had ten eight. He had like ace three, so I'm forty five percent chance to make it to win a to win a medal. He doubles up, and then I just was card dead the rest of the uh, the match. Uh, I was uh, the last match of the round of eight, so I ended up getting fifth place. I busted. I, I shoved uh, Jack six of like three big blinds. He had of course queen jack, and the flop came jack jack ten no chop. So I had three jacks when I lost anyway. So I, I end up bubbling another heads up championship medal event so close again. Uh, so again, frustrating, but you know I, I I'm I'm happy rather than just just sitting out. At least I I managed to go as close as you could because again I I was I wanted to respect the Raymer interview and I I was done with that tournament by about the one hour mark in the interview. So that's still not out of two hours I was able to commit to Raymer's interview. I, I don't think he noticed too much or if he did at all. So I'm. I think it was okay. Yeah, I just it popped up on my screen because I was sitting out, and so I just like I just marked sitting out, and I just focused on the interview because it's Greg Raymer, <laughs> you know. I I told I asked Ben, I'm like, if if we're in the if I'm if we're both in the round of eight and we're interviewing Greg, should I just like go all in every hand? And Ben was like, oh no, you can't do that because I said, it's the I, round I, said, of I, said eight. I said if we're, we're going to sit out instead, then of course do that. Yeah. No, you you said that going all in every hand, it's like it's the round of eight. It's too important. You shouldn't be doing. It. I, I, I said you should play it. Yeah, yeah. In, in the in the context, they should just be you should be playing it instead of not of not playing at all. Whatever. I didn't. You know, I could have gone all in every hand, given myself a small shot, but I just I wanted to just focus on on Greg Raymer. So so again, it's it still I still increased my MSL points from that fifth place. It's my tie for my best finish in the in the whole roster events, and then a, a couple of days after that was the six card Omaha tournament. Yeah, and I have never played six card Omaha before. That was a really interesting yeah. event. I kind of liked it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it really makes you have to think things through the combinations in your hands and that, you know, just because you have a pair of aces doesn't necessarily mean you should play your hand a certain way because if your other cards don't associate with the aces, I thought I really liked it. So we were actually at the same table for this mm -hmm. event. I think it was um, 28 players in this event. Yeah, and it's a six max because you know six cards. I I've played a small bit of five card Omaha before, but never six cards. So obviously the percentages for hands run very close to each other. Um, and we were actually table neighbors, and we remained at the same table together the entire tournament. And but the, the thing is that Sam's a very tight player, so he, he was right on my left. So I was kind kind of hesitant to like really raise too much pre-flip aggressively because i know that if uh if sam re-raises me then i'm in really bad shape and he, and he can he can just abuse me all day if, if it did so I, I was playing pretty tight pre-flop the problem was at our six max table there was in the first hour like one or two sit outs at our table and then the other stack at our table was just a big stack so it, it, it was really hard to in six card omaha build a pot with the nuts and get paid off because People were just so reluctant to put any money on the river but the absolute nuts. And since you know you're gonna obviously not you're gonna miss a lot of flops or not make a lot of draws in, in any any tournament, it was really hard to build a stack for me. Yeah, same here. I mean, I think my top amount was 14k or so, and the starting stack was 10. So I, you know, pick up a, some small pots here or there. I called two or three bluffs on the river. But in, in those instances, it was a pretty easy call. It's like I had the second nuts. Uh, you know, I got a call with with the straight or something. Yeah, it's just, you know, again, I liked playing six card Omaha because it adds a strategic element when you have those two extra cards in your hand. But yeah, I mean, we were just card dead. I was just card dead. And, yeah, and even when I, when I would make the nuts, the, block, the pot would be so small or they wouldn't call the river bet. So it really didn't matter. Um, yeah. 
you know, I, I won my fair share of pots because we had so many sit outs, but I just couldn't really build any chips. I, I think the max I ever was like 11,200, something really small. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you finished in 11th place. You, act, you were pretty consistently ahead of me in the chip counts, and you actually had a decent stack on your bust out hand. I think you like flopped the set, right? And then you got- I had like 6,700. So it wasn't like a, we were, we were both the short stacks, I think when, when I busted. Yeah, I had um, a set of twos. It was like deuce five king with like two clubs. The turn was a seven. I figured that was a brick. And I was now worried because there's straight and flush draws out there. So I went all in. Uh, this was pot limit Omaha, by the way. Uh, but I had, you know, I was below the pot, so I could go all in. So anyway, I go all in. The guy tanked for a moment, so I figured, all right, he's got a draw. He called. He had a set of sevens, so the seven game. It, it turned. It turned to out of Turned the set, so one out, and then I bricked. So that was it. Same went on eleventh place. So we, you know, we made the final two tables. Yeah. You know, final twelve is it's so always same on eleventh, and then I was just I had like four big blinds, and I put three of them in uh, pre flop. I had a little bit left over. I missed a flop. That puts me all the night to fold it because I have just dead nothing on that flop. So I shoved my last like half a big blind. Uh, I got, got like multiple multiple cards, of course, because of the blinds. And uh, I was just drawing almost dead after the flop because I missed it. So I finished in 10th. You finished in 11th. So still I, I, enough to qualify for my like point total for the MSO to increase my score. Still not great because uh, I think I'm totally out of it by this point. Uh, yeah. for the overall gold and stuff but there's still three events to win a medal i don't i don't care if i don't overall uh rank in the top three i just want to win medal in an event um you know it's funny how with six Lord Omaha, i had absolutely no experience and probably heads up hold them is probably one of my best games on the whole mso roster so yeah uh, it does you know I'm, I'm happy that i got i had two top 10 finishes i guess but uh it just it sinks when you just you just can never you know, get a get paid off by when you have a big hand. It's the players play so tight, and they're just um, just never in a good spot uh, to uh, really really run up a stack. I've never I've never really had a huge stack in any event uh, besides the horse event way back when in January. Yeah, I mean we're both in the top ten for the poker standings. I'm in sixth. Uh, ben, you're in eighth right now. Yeah, I've got one spot and a different American actually. Uh, eclipsed me for some place, although my point total has gone up. So, you know, that's yeah. Cool. So, I mean, I'm at 376 points, and Hugo Pereira is in third place right now, 422 points. So, I'd have to pretty much medal the next three events, I think, to have any shot. Uh, which you know, who knows that could happen, and, and, he, and he'd have to not increase his score either. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, the in terms of meddling overall, it doesn't look like it's going to happen, but you know, who knows? Uh, you know, I, I mean, it definitely else. feels like if. Uh, they had had the point system from last year. I'd probably have a much higher score overall because in this in this year's version, it's only the the the, the your five your top five performances in the right. whole events count towards your final score. So I I actually have I think a better worst finish than everybody above me mm -hmm. in the open in the open events. But because I don't have any you know medal medals, uh, my composite average isn't as high as uh, everybody else so something that i've noticed so maybe hopefully maybe they'll, they'll get some feedback and they'll change it next year you never know we'll see and there's there's three events left there's the no limit hold'em which again is probably my my best shot at winning a medal here probably i think same for you there's the deuce to seven triple draw which again i i've played a bit in you know eight game mix here and there it's not something i consider myself above average in it by any means uh, and then there's the Raz event is the last event, Raz, which again, I like Raz. I, I know how to play, I think, better than the average poker stars, Joe Schmo. So I think I have a fair chance if I don't get super unlucky. I mean, I lost in Raz in the horse events when I busted in seventh place, but I had the best cards when it went all in. So, you know, the, the, sometimes the, there's some luck goes against you in Raz sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I predicted back in January I wasn't going to get a medal this year. So I'm sticking, I'm sticking with that. I don't think I'm going to medal. Uh, but, you know, I'll give it my best shot in the next three tournaments and see what happens. Right. You know, wouldn't mind being the top ranking American in terms of points. I don't know why. I like thinking like that. I don't know. I well, don't know again, I'm, 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 in, I'm in competition with you for that very yeah. same uh, title. Exactly. So we'll see what happens. We have three events left. And uh, I, again, no limit hold them. I, I do feel like uh, if I have being pot limit or limit, uh, I can really maybe get the better of some of these players that keep, keep hogging all the, all the medals in the top five finishes. So uh, we'll see what happens.
Yeah, I mean, there's only there's only one player who has won two gold medals. So the medals, for the most part, have been fairly spread out. There's only a couple of players that have won two medals, period. So, and then, I mean, for the overall Mind Sport Olympia, because there's other events too. I mean, there's every people from all over the world are winning medals. So this is really anybody's game if you want to participate in these last few events. There's uh, Go, there's Russian Droughts, there's a chess, couple of chess variants as well. So if you're at all interested in the MSO, uh, you might not be able to win a medal in a meta event, but you can definitely try to win a medal in, in a number of other events. Yeah, that's true. And uh, again, I'm not, I'm not giving up yet. I mean, you know, it, it'll be 28 to 32 people probably in, in another Hold'em event. And I, I do feel like I can, I can make it happen if I, uh, you know, just don't get unlucky, which, uh, you know, is that will happen, but you never know. Yeah, we'll see. I think that just about wraps up this uh, relatively short episode of our podcast. I want to thank you all for listening. And uh, again, we're always looking for comments, suggestions for our next subject matter. We have, I mean, there's still, we have no shortage of poker content to, to, to discuss. It's just that, you know, we always love to take uh, suggestions too. Yep. And thank you again to Greg Raymer for your generosity and for uh, joining us for three hours. And again, as I mentioned, anybody who wants to be on the show, any interview, uh, people who want to hop on and let us ask them questions, let us know and we'll work things out. Again, you know, you can plug anything you want on the show. Uh, we can't really pay you, but we can give you, you know, a platform. Exposure is what counts, right? So just let us know. Oh, or if you want to come on here to interview us, I mean, flip the script. That's always, you know, it'd be like an April Fool's Day thing. I'm kind of funny too. <laughs> yeah. Give us a call, ESPN. Give us, uh, give us an hour uh, interview. <laughs> Anyway, guys, enjoy your poker, enjoy your TV, and enjoy your poker on TV. Take care, everybody.